Hi, and welcome back to Fresh BCSE Tech and eLearning Help. In this video, we're going to do some training on a feature within the It's Learning online learning management system, and that feature is called Learning Paths. So if you would like access to this slide deck, there is a short link URL there across the bottom. It's bit.ly, it's paths, and you have access to these slides and training materials. So the goal for this session is to learn how to use Learning Paths which provide our students with self-paced step-by-step lessons. We're also going to learn about learning paths so we can practice building them and using some of the additional features within a learning path, like adding options for learners in terms of their learning resources and activities, and how to add in branching pathways into a learning path so that depending on how a student scores on an assessment, they're taken to different resources based on that threshold score that is determined by the teacher. So we do this so we can ideally give our students a more universally designed environment and to help remove learning barriers for our students and to build in opportunities for formative assessments or checks for understanding midway through a lesson so we can reassess and reevaluate our instruction from there. So what is a learning path? If you have not used this feature in its learning before, it is a collection of resources and it guides students through them step by step. Resources in a learning path can be anything that you make on its learning. It can be files from your Google Drive, really open opportunities on all of that. You can really use any resource you want in a learning path. You can put in assignments, tests, quizzes, um, pages, other folders, links, videos, whatever you would like. In steps in this learning path, you have the ability to rearrange those however you like. You can create a learning path by putting everything in a folder and then turning the folder into a learning path, which is probably the easiest way to get started with using learning paths if you use folders quite a bit. And the fun part with a learning path is if you add an assessment into it using the It's Learning test tool, that's where you can add in those different branches that I was talking about a few minutes ago, where students have a different experience in that learning path, depending on how they score on that test. So why, why should you use a learning path? If we're talking in terms of universal design for learning, learning paths really give your students a clear, simple, straightforward lesson format. They have a start button. If you've built a learning path into your lesson, they click start, takes up their whole screen, and it guides them through everything step by step. They see all of the steps there on the left-hand side of their screen. They can go back. They can't skip forward unless they've actually viewed a step first. So it really kind of sets a slower pace so students aren't rushing through things. Um, and again, it it helps students kind of manage their own time and pieces of the lesson because of that. It also is a great way to give students choice in a lesson. When we think of a learning path, you might initially think, oh, that means that all of my lesson resources and steps have to be digital, and they don't. There's lots of ways you can build in non-screen time activities in a learning path by just writing them on the screen and then having those um, offline activities available to students or directing them to do an offline activity as a step in this path. It can really be a simple way for you as the teacher to manage your, or your organization of your lesson and kind of streamline the flow of events in that lesson as well. Like I said, I kind of got ahead of myself there for a second, but not all of the steps in a learning path need to be digital. There's been lots of examples in our district and outside of our district where teachers have built in offline activities in a learning path to try to give students, again, more options and freedom in how they design their learning experience. So an example here for elementary would be that a teacher during their English language arts block has students pick between a couple of different resources. So they can read a text online in their Wonders textbook. Um, they can read a paper book, listen to the recording, or they can do a small group activity with the teacher. And that's assuming that it's an in-class setting. Another option would be at the secondary level, students could work and have different options there. They can read digitally or read a printed text. They can do a type activity on its learning, a video response, or even a oral presentation with the teacher. You have lots of opportunities there. And all of these tools are ones that can be used within its learning. There's not necessarily a need to use outside resources unless you want to. So different routes in the learning path are determined by the test tool in its learning. So if you build a test and it's learning, it can be simple, it can be a little bit lengthier, up to you. Depending on how students score on that test, you can determine where they go next and you set the threshold. So if you want students to score an 80% and then you decide that they don't score an 80%, I want them to have a different learning experience. You can have them retake the test until they get that threshold score, the 80%, 
or you can have them be directed to some remedial resources. So maybe they get extra review materials or they play a Kahoot game or they do something different to help them review before they move on to more advanced steps in that learning path. The other option is that if your learning path has lots of remedial steps built into it already, if a student shows mastery by getting that 80% or whatever threshold you set on that test, then they can jump to the end of the learning path and be finished for the day and move on to something else. So those are the three different options you have within a learning path and branching. So we are actually gonna start diving in to building learning paths. There are a few examples here, and there's even more on BCSC Connect if you wanted to borrow some ideas from there. But here is an example from a Spanish class. This one only has five steps, and there's pages the person put into this lesson as well as a discussion. The next one, well, I guess there's really, this could be two or it could be one, just depending on how lengthy you want your learning path to be. But this is from an elementary classroom. There's the ELA block here that the teacher set up to be in the morning part of the lesson. So there's links, there's a survey the students interact with, a journal entry assignment, and then some instructions and additional resources there that students view. And then in the afternoon, it looked like they were turning in assignments to her and interacting with some of their digital materials. And the last example here is from a social studies class at the secondary level, middle school. And this one is showing another way of building a learning path and building in some different tools within its learning. So this one is an example where they have the test built in to show those different branching pathways where you can set that up and then direct students to remedial resources or more practice if needed. If you would like to fly through this at your own pace and look at a shorter tutorial video, there are op options here. This is a video that's about five minutes long, six minutes long, that walks you through how to make a learning path and include some of those different ways to use the test tool. And then here is a written guide. Page one of that guide is what is a learning path? Why should you use it? And lesson ideas. And then page two of that guide is the step-by-step -step process on how to create one. Not mean to click that, but if you click the picture, it will take you to that specific guide. And then the last resource I wanted to share here before I show you how to make a learning path are some best practices. And this was from an interview with a BCS UDL facilitator who was really working with teachers pretty closely in her building on how to use learning paths during e-learning and beyond. And she shared some of her lessons that she learned along the way, just some tips for getting started with them in your classroom. So this is great if you're a seasoned learning path user or if you're just starting off with them, just some things and advice from her. So we are going to dive into making a learning path. So first thing, make sure you're signed on to It's Learning and go to your course and then go to your resources. So there's a couple of ways that you can start building a learning path. Technically, there's two. Just depends on how much you've planned out or if you haven't planned things out quite yet. So if I have already made all of my lesson materials that I want to use for that day, maybe I have copied things over from a past school year into my new course for this school year, and I know I want to borrow those again, um, or at least kind of use that as draft before I make some changes and edit some things for the school year. So I put those things in my course and I put them in a folder. You can turn any folder into a learning path. So if I go to the three dot button here in the top right corner, I'll click that and I'll click make learning path. And I do want to point out here that if this is what you're doing, you have your folder, you have your resources here, these things do not have to be finalized necessarily when you click that Make Learning Path button. It's best if you have your test finished, just so you don't have to go back and edit that again. But if you know you might need to add some more pieces or if you notice later on you have a typo in any one of these other steps that are more informational tools for students, not something that they're interacting with, it's not an activity tool, then it's okay if you go back and you make those changes. They also don't have to be in the exact order you want them to right now. And you don't necessarily have to have all of these elements in the folder if you change your mind later on and don't want those steps in your learning path. But if I click this three dot button, I would select make learning path. And then I'll show you the builder here in a second. The other way that you can make a learning path is simply by just clicking the add button and show all. And this shows you all of the tools that you can use on its learning and learning path shows up as an option. So if you click this way, this way kind of assumes that you have not wanted to pull things from a folder per se. To get started on this one, maybe you're building as you're going. So it's just personal preference and how you get started. 
You could pull from your course if you already had content. You can pull from your Google Drive if that's where you're pulling all your learning resources from. Or you can pull from the library, which is past courses. You can't make an activity piece or a resource from this menu. You have to have it already made or you have to pull from Google Drive. So I don't recommend this way if you haven't made any of the pages, assignments, or tests that you want to include in your learning path yet because you can't do that from here. That's usually why I kind of lean towards doing the folder method, but you could do that if your learning path steps have more Google Doc resources than its learning ones. So if I go back to my folder and I do make learning path, this is how I get started with making one. It brings up the learning path builder. And from here, I can arrange the order of events that I would like to have in my learning path. If I wanna delete a step, I can do that here as well. So maybe I don't need this, because I don't want students to walk up and turn them in me anymore. They can just send me a message or do something else on its learning. So I'm just, I'm just gonna delete this step. If I delete it, there's some key things to know here. If I delete it entirely, it is gone from this course. And if you don't have this saved anywhere else, meaning it's not in another course or it's not saved in your library, then this resource is gone forever. If you don't want to delete this resource entirely, you select move. Then you can move it out of this folder, which moves it out of this learning path builder. It's not lost, it's not deleted forever, it's just moved away out of your builder here. And that's what I'm going to do. So I could select it from any one of these folders already in my course, but if I just collect, if I just select this top one, it just moves it into my resource tree. If I didn't have a particular place, I want to put it. And I'll click OK. So if you notice, that step is now gone from my learning path. Okay. So you have some choices in how you can design your learning path. When I have used these in classrooms, when I've seen teachers use learning paths pretty effectively, they usually start off their learning path with sharing the lesson goal and instructions for students. And if you're introducing a new technology tool as a part of this learning path, or if a learning path is something new to your students, it's helpful if you include a screencast tutorial video for students as well that walks through and explains to them what they're going to be doing for the day and prepares them for using those new tools. So that's the example that I'm showing here. The lesson goal is written out there, the why behind the goal. Below that is a video overview of what students are gonna be doing. It can be something really short and sweet. It can be a screencast too. And then there's standards and then written instructions there so students can watch the video to get the instructions or they can read the instructions there. And if you notice, if I click on any one of these resources in the Learning Path Builder, I'll have the ability to edit them again. So like I said a few minutes ago, it does not have to be finalized. When you make a folder into a Learning Path, you can still edit these features if you need to. So if I wanted to change this first step here, I wanted to delete some of these spaces because that is space a little funny. I want to delete other content or add state standards there. I could do that. I'll click Save. So now those changes are made. If I click over here on the left side, this is my resources tree, or I could get to it from the resources tab. My learning path, when I'm in learning path builder mode, it is not visible to students yet. It won't become visible to students until you make the settings that way. So if you want students to get started, but you don't have all your resources ready, they won't be able to see anything until you turn on the learning path, which I'll show here after we finish building. Other things to know, in a learning path, by default, a lot of the tools have it to where if a student views, the t views this particular step in the learning path, then they get to advance the next one. It keeps them on this screen for about 20 seconds or so before a notification pops up that allows them to move on to the next one. It's only with the tools, the activity tools, where the students have to show their understanding, whether through a test or turning in an assignment, that you can change the settings to whether they can move on depending on their score or if they've gotten feedback from you yet that says they can move on. So you don't have a whole lot of control over just consumption resources, but a creation, interactive resource, you set the threshold of what the student does next. So options aren't technically something that's built into this tool yet, but you do have the ability to still give your students options even though it's not something built into the tool. And when I say that, I mean that there's not a button in the Learning Path Builder that says, I want to give my students options for representation, or I want to give my students options for showing their understanding by doing a test or by doing an assignment tool or by turning in Google Slides presentation. Those features are not built into the Learning Path yet, 
I think it's on their roadmap. But there is kind of a sneaky, sly way that you can still give your students options, just like you might in the regular classroom. And that is by using the page tool or by using the assignment tool in your learning path. So this is actually a lesson that I did in person with my students when I was in the classroom. And I know that there's been a few other teachers that have kind of used this approach as well and figured out that you can give options to students if you're pretty clever about how you do it. So if I wanted to give my students options here, their goal was to be taking notes in this initial activity using a resource, using two resources of their choice. So I had four options that they could pick from, a paper material we had in class, a reading, a video, or slides. So because the learning path tool does not allow me just to build that all into a learning path with a single button, what I did was I made a page and then I put those options in my page so that my students still had a choice. Now, I don't have any way of measuring what resource I looked at here. They could mark that on their notes and tell me what resource they use. You don't have a whole lot of control there, but you can still build in the options here so your students have them, which I think is pretty powerful. You can use pages because they're so flexible for students to still have options and learning resources. Now, if I wanted to give students options in how they show their understanding in a learning path, if you use the assignment tool, remember on the assignment tool, you can add in any type of file as your answer. There is an audio tool built into it, video camera, you can add links, you can add pictures, you can attach files from your Google Drive. So if you wanna give your students options in a learning path to show their understanding, add in the assignment tool, like what I did here is my last step, and then your students have options already given to them. Sometimes it's helpful to remind them what those options are, but if you build in this tool, it's a way to provide choice when there's otherwise on a button that does that for you. So if I'm happy with these steps, or if I want to rearrange them, if I drag and drop these, I can change the order. And then here is the part where you can have some fun and make things a little bit more complicated if you would like. So my best advice is if you're getting started with using tests and a learning path to take students down different roads, it's helpful if you tinker with it, if you practice, if you have students test it out for you or do something that's low stakes. So it can be something that's not even academically related to what you're talking about in class that day to have a trial run with it and just see it from a student perspective. Or you can even ask your UDL facilitator to look over it for you or even ask a colleague and they can give you feedback. So if you add a test into a learning path, you have the ability to determine different routes based on students' performance. So initially by default, it's just set to where my students complete this short little test, which is a five question check for understanding, a whole lot of pressure associated with this. It's just five questions so I can see how they're doing. By default, if they complete it, they move on. Everyone has the same experience in this learning path. But if I wanna change things, and I really think it's important that my students who don't score a certain percentage get more review before they turn in the more important assignment here, the summative assignment, then I wanna give them either the opportunity to recheck, to retake this test so they can see what they missed and have another shot, or I can give them another review. And in this example, I already built out that review, but if you hadn't done that yet, and it's a link to like a review game or a review slideshow, you can always add it as a step and then move it up to where you need it to. So for this example, I already have it built in. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide what score directs students down different paths. So this was a five question quiz. So I'm gonna set it to where if they get an 80%, that's what determines it. So if students score an 80%, then they get to move on to step seven. So they skip this review step. Why? Because they set, they reach that mastery standard that I wanted them to reach and then they're good to go. They're ready to move on to our final activity of the lesson where they showcase their whole understanding. If the student doesn't score an 80%, then they get taken to this review where they get another opportunity to revisit some of the concepts from earlier in the lesson before they move into their show your understanding activity. The other options you have here, so that's the remediation option that I was talking about earlier. The other one is you can have students retake the test. So if I change this, I'll have them repeat this step. Now this will change your learning path a little bit in that it doesn't let you skip a bonus review. I have this set up as a review. 
But if I wanted students to repeat this test, it will just take them to the next resource if they score that 80%. If they don't, then they repeat this step. It sees every step is being required and won't let students skip it. So if I didn't want this review to be in there anymore, I could just delete it or move it out of this learning path. So that gives my students the ability to move on if they meet that 80% or they have to repeat the test. So there's no review in that one. The last option is that if a student reaches mastery, then what you can have them do is move to the finish. So if I have a student who gets this 80% or gets higher, then maybe this next step is another review and they've shown mastery, they probably don't need that or maybe decide they don't need that. So if a student scores an 80% or better, they don't do this step six, they are done with the learning path, they're done with the lesson for the day. So that's a way to give your students the ability to jump ahead and probably lends itself better to a learning path with multiple steps after this check for understanding. That's just a way of organizing it for yourself. So if I am finished with my learning path, then what I'm going to do is click complete path. If I want to add more steps, I could and rearrange them. And for an exit ticket, this was used with the assignment tool. If I wanted to go and make any changes to that, I could. This one is an example of providing your students choices. So in this one, students could showcase their understanding in several ways. They could do a video, audio, or type their response. I'm finished building that, and this assignment looks okay to me. You have the ability to change the settings on the assignment tool as well. So, all right. So with the drop-down menu, oh, I didn't mean to click that. The drop-down menu with the assignment tool, submitted means that if the student turns in their work, then they're, they could move on to the next step if there was one of this learning path or move on to the finish or be finished with the learning path. Um, they don't have to wait on me to mark them as being completed, me as the teacher. They don't have to worry. They don't have to wait and worry about getting feedback from me before they can move on. If I change this to completed, then me as the teacher, I determine when they've completed that task. It does not depend on if they submitted it or not. They could submit it, but they're not allowed to move on until on my screen, I mark them as being complete, meaning I give them feedback and that can move them along that path. So that's a helpful thing to be mindful of when you're building on here is if you build in some of these, um, it's automatically set to where they'll move on. But if it you change those settings, you can build in stops in the learning path, which might be good breaking points during a lesson to have conversation or to catch everyone up on the same page or on the same speed. Um, but if you're not intending to do that, be mindful of these things so you don't accidentally lock students out of going on to next steps if you didn't intend to. There's been teachers in BCSE that have used this specific feature. They've made a learning path for several days at a time, and then they add this feature in when they find it's a good point to have students stop on the learning path and then do something different in class, and that gives everyone the chance to catch up and be on the same page. So if I'm finished, I'll do complete path. And then you see here, it's still not visible. So I can continue editing that pathway if I want, which opens up the Learning Path Builder event. And if I need to make this visible to students so they can start participating in it, I'll click this, visible to students. If you realize you need to make a change to this after you've already made it visible, you can go and click these individual tools and edit them again if you need to. The only one that I do not recommend going and changing if you've already started a learning path is the test, because if you go through and you change quite a bit, it's going to change student scores and might mess up the ability to direct them to different resources and steps because their scores are different after you've made those changes and might void out their test results. So I don't recommend making changes there, but if you need to make a small change to a page or a note or um, an assignment, you can just not necessarily the test tool. So the way this looks for a student, you can preview it by going to the drop down menu here and selecting pupil. And if I go to my resources tab, I see my Mongol Empire learning path and I'll click start. And what this does, like I said, it takes up the whole screen. 
it has me on this set resource for a set amount of time. So I can't just move on until I see this confirmation message. The confirmation message won't stay out for very long. It's about 10 seconds and then it goes away. So I can click when the message is still there. And if it's not over here on the left, it also pops up with the menu of all the steps that I have access to at this point. So I'll move to my next step where I'll see my instructions on what I'm supposed to be doing. Then I'll continue. And here I see my different choices and learning resources. Then I can move on from there. This was the review game before the test. All right, and whenever it's time for me to start this test, I would click start. And I set the threshold here at 80. So if I don't hit, get 80, you're going to see what happens. I'm going to get these wrong on purpose. All right. So I finished my test here. And I did not do so well. So when we set this up, said that I need to do this test over again um, because my teacher set it up that way to where I had to repeat it if I didn't get a certain score. So if I go back to check for understanding, I get the opportunity to take it over again. And I saw what answers I got wrong. So now I can try it again. All right, so I met the threshold score and then it tells me I have a new step available. So I'll continue to the next one, which is the last part of this learning path. So what I'll do is I'll click answer and then I can type out my response. If I don't see all of the buttons here, just remind your students that if they click more options, now they have more choices than how they can respond. We'll click submit. Right. And then because I submitted it, I'm good to go there. And my assignment's finished. And then I can close out of my learning path. All right, so that is the student view in a learning path. And again, the best piece of advice here is if you're getting started with a learning path, it's helpful if you kind of play around with it first and tinker. Um, it's definitely a tool that can be really simple or very much more complicated depending on how you like to use it. Um, it's a very, it's a very intuitive tool for your students if you dive in and if you have any questions, please let us know. This is the point in the video where you can practice experimenting and tinkering out with it yourself. If you want more examples and resources, you can find them on BCSE Connect or through some of these YouTube channels I have linked there. And if you have questions, you can always reach out